morning, TSC. Glad that you guys are here. I'm Pastor Eric. Nice to meet you guys. If you guys are new, I'm welcome to the Source Church. I just want to read today's passage that we're going to kind of focus on in chapter 3, and then we're going to pray and then jump into God's Word together, okay? All right, so reading out of chapter 3, verse 7, when Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile And Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you, he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, he said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are the guardian redeemer of our family. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. Let's pray as we jump into God's word together. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you, God, that uh, you have given your word to transform our lives, not just to be given information, God, but to transform us in our hearts as we become more like you. Help us, God, to see you, to see how awesome you are, how faithful you are, God, to your people, and that we may love you more and more, God. We thank you that your word is our guide. It is our place to find and discover, to hear from you. So I pray today, Lord, that you would open up people's hearts. You would open up our ears to hear your word, and that what is preached, what is spoken, God, would minister to everyone who hears today. We love you. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said together with a mighty voice, amen. Amen. All right, so as we jump into Ruth chapter 3, first off, my name is Pastor Eric, and I'm one of the pastors here at the Source Church, and I'm really thankful and excited to be a part of the series and be able to preach out of this chapter specifically. Uh, It touches a very beautiful and important uh, reality for me that I love teaching God's people about, and but I want to give some context first for this chapter because it's, in some ways this chapter is a li- has some awkwardness to it if, you're not, if you don't understand culture and context. Ruth, as a story, is part of the narrative that's happening in the Old Testament. We learned that in our past studies about how the Bible is just giant narrative of God bringing forth his promise of his son. And so what we see is, you know, God has come to Abraham, and through Abraham, he's promised that he's going to have a blessing over him, and then he comes to his people, they're enslaved in Egypt, and he sends Moses to free them, and then now they're going through uh, the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy, and then they come to Joshua, and they're taking the land that God has promised them now, and now in the book of Judges, which is the backdrop of the, the book of Ruth, is that in Judges, the people of Israel have become complacent. And have completely neglected to study and know God's word and his plan for their life. Because they're already already in the land. And now they begin to start getting away from God's worship. And and, and doing other things they shouldn't be doing. And God sends saviors all throughout the book of Judges. You may have heard some of them. Samson, Japheth. uh, One of them is a notable is a woman, Deborah. She's raised up to, to be part of helping the people of Israel fight against their enemies. And so, but the people of Israel continuously, time and time again, fall into the same cycle of neglecting God's word. And all of us, at some point in our lives, we all experience such things. We all just kind of go through a judge's period where we're, we're just going through a time of ne- neglecting and not knowing what's going on in our lives. And, and, and God it's hard to get back to where we're going. But the, the crazy thing is for the original hearers of the book of Ruth is that, you know, God has been working through his people primarily. He's been working through people that he has raised a part of his covenant, a part of the people he has chosen. And so here we, at, we are at the end of Judges and they're wondering how is God going to continue to bring his promise for his people that they would have a savior, a king, someone who will t- lead the people of Israel, who will shepherd them very well. And, and here it is, God in the book of Judges, people are waiting and if you were reading the story with the Israelites, they're like, oh, we got a savior? Is it gonna be Samson? No, it's not Samson. Okay, is it gonna be Japheth? No, it's not Japheth. Is it going to be Deborah? No, it's not Deborah. And, and God's continuing to move the story. And then at the end of Judges, there's this really horrible situation that happens that, that almost leaves any reader to be like, where is this going to go? This is like a dark alley moment. 
And then God, in his wisdom, in his beauty, in his wonder, brings up a woman named Ruth who's not a part of the people of Israel at all. He brings up this woman who's actually in a neighboring country called Moab, and Moab is actually part of the people who descended from Lot, who was Abraham's nephew. And so, they're, they're, they, in fact, at this point in time, they're a whole nation that is considered from the Israelites' perspective, they're godless. They, they don't worship the one true God. They're not in covenant with God. Uh, if anything, in many ways, they're enemies. And what happens is, is in the book of Ruth, we saw in ch- previous chapters, in Ruth chapter one, that El- Elimelech, he comes and he leaves Israel and he goes to live in Moab because Israel is going through a famine. And so he wants to survive, but that, you know, if you read that and study that, that's not a good thing in the perspective of the Israelite. That's like you're a sellout, right? You, you're leaving your country. You're not here when we have to suffer together. You're kind of just leaving to, to do your own thing. And so he goes to Moab, and then he takes his sons and his wife. They all go, and then his sons marry Moabite women. Which, again, is not a good thing. If you read the Old Testament, when the Israelites did that, when they intermarried with people who are not part of their people, that was considered a bad thing because they were worried about, you know, people uh, influencing each other with false religion and things like that. And so, again, you know, you read that and you're like, well, that's, you know, in, in perspective of the original readers, they're like, where is God going with this story? This is not a good situation. And then, even worse, Elimelech and all of his sons die. They're, now they're off the story from chapter one. So now you're thinking, well, so these three stranded widows now are the point of the story? Like, where, where is God bringing this? And then thinking that maybe it's Naomi, like it's the, Naomi is the, the wife of Elimelech, who is an Israelite. You think that that's where God's going to go with it. And, and, and she's a widow, but uh, she has two daughter-in-laws with her now. One of them stays behind to stay in Moab and, and, and go back to her family, Okay. And she'll be well off. She'll be taken care of. But here stands out this woman named Ruth, this Moabite woman. And she, she says something in chapter 1 that's so astounding that, that I want to focus on and highlight, what it is, which actually is going to lead to show it's the rest of the entire story of Ruth. In Ruth chapter 1, it says that in verse 16, 17, when she's asked, okay, okay, your, your other sister-in-law, she went back to home. Okay, Ruth, why, why don't you do that? Naomi's like, I'm going back to Israel, and it's not good for me. This is a very bad situation. We've all lost our husbands, and uh, you know what? Maybe you should just go home too. And Ruth says this to Naomi. She says, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, even if, if even death separates you and me. And so, Ruth, we, so that's a powerful, that's, those are powerful words right there. This is someone who's like, I'm committed to being with you, Naomi. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to leave you stranded in this terrible situation that you're going through. So Ruth, well, as we see go, going on in Ruth chapter 2, we see that Ruth ends up meeting a man. As she goes to, Israelite, or to Israel with Naomi, uh, she meets a family member that they're connected to, Boaz. So it, what ends up turning into the story as you're reading, if you would have been one of the original readers, you realize that this is, this is the Cinderella story of the Old Testament, all right? This is, the, this is where this woman goes, and she didn't have anything. She's poor. She's, she's broke. She doesn't have anything. And then she meets this really rich guy, Boaz, right? He's the entrepreneur, Israelite. And, and happen chance, actually, Boaz is actually his mother is Rahab, and Rahab is, again, another Gentile woman, a non-Jewish woman who's a part of the story of Joshua where she actually helps the Israelites when they were going uh, to escape, two of them to escape when they, were, when they were trapped in Jericho to spy it out, and Rahab ends up helping them out. And so actually Boaz is actually Rahab's son, ironically. And Rahab and Ruth are both a part of what this whole story is about. They're, they're a part of the lineage of Jesus. They're actually the two women that are mentioned in Matthew chapter 1 of Jesus' lineage. It traces back all the 14 generations, going back, showing all the people who are part of Jesus and how he comes into the world as a son of Adam. And 
Uh, Ruth, it mentions, usually it's always like the father of so-and-so, the father of so-and-so, the father of so-and-so. And then there's only two people that are mentioned while the father and so-and-so, it's mentioned, oh yeah, Rahab, who's the mother of Boaz. And then Boaz and what we're going to see as Ruth to get together, and uh, she's also mentioned in the lineage of Jesus as well. And so this is the backdrop. Ruth is a love story in the Old Testament, and it's beautiful. It's wonderful, as we're going to see in chapter 3. But also, while Ruth is a story about love, Ruth is a story about loyalty. Everybody say loyalty. This is a lost concept to people today. Especially in a time where if, if, if you are in a bad situation or someone or you have any kind of bad light on you, people don't want to hang around you, people don't want to be committed to you. In a time where everybody is just looking out for themselves, very much like the book of Judges where in the book of Judges, the people of Israel, this is the line that's continuously said throughout it. In those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. And so Ruth is the story about a woman not just showing, not just a love story about her and Boaz, but it's a story about her loyalty. And I wanna, I wanna focus and dial into what loyalty is in the Old Testament, and more importantly, why for how it, how it's relative to us today of what God is looking for. Because what I'm going to make the claim is that God is looking for people in the world who are willing to be loyal. And that when he finds that in in us, he uses that to bring us into his his blessing, into his provision, and to his protection. But before we do that, I want us to get a little bit of a, a backdrop, a history of what loyalty is in the Old Testament. So I want us to turn right now just for a few minutes to this uh, really great video from the Bible Project to explain these things, and then we're going to jump into Ruth chapter 3. If you tried to describe what God is like, it could be difficult or daunting. But when the people who wrote the Bible pondered the mystery of God, they consistently described God's character in this way, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, overflowing with loyal love and faithfulness. We're going to look at this fourth phrase, loyal love. It translates the Hebrew word chesed, which is hard to translate into any language because it combines the ideas of love, generosity, and enduring commitment all into one. Chesed describes an act of promise-keeping loyalty that is motivated by deep personal care. Like in the story of Ruth, Ruth is a foreigner married to an Israelite man, But tragically, her husband dies along with his brother and his father. All Ruth has left is her widowed mother-in-law, Naomi, who has nothing to give her. Naomi tells Ruth she should go back to her people, but instead, Ruth promises to stay by Naomi's side and take care of her. And as other people watch Ruth keep this promise over time, they call it an act of chesed. Notice that Ruth's chesed is not conditional or based on Naomi's worth. Rather, it's an expression of Ruth's character. She just is a generous and loving person who keeps her word. That's chesed. Now, Ruth's loyal love is truly inspiring, but the one who shows the most enduring chesed in the Bible is God. Like in the story about Jacob, who is a treacherous liar even to his own family. But despite that, God chooses him and repeats the promise he made to Jacob's grandfather, Abraham that he would have a huge family through whom God would restore his blessing to the nations. And so 20 years later, when Jacob realizes how undeserving he is, he says to God, I'm not worthy of all the chesed you've shown me. And he's right. But God's chesed was never about Jacob's worth in the first place. It's a display of God's generous loyalty to his promise. God's chesed continues into the story of Jacob's descendants, the Israelites. When they're enslaved by Pharaoh in Egypt, we're told that God remembered his promise to Abraham and Jacob, so God defeats Egypt and raises up Moses to liberate the people and lead them into the promised land. And in the story, this is called an act of chesed because it was about God keeping his word. Now, on their way to the promised land, the Israelites are scared of the nations around them and they doubt that God can protect them. So the people threaten to kill Moses and appoint a new leader to take them back to Egypt. God is understandably hurt and angry, but Moses steps in and says, forgive the sin of these people because of your great chesed. 
Notice that Moses asked God to forgive, not because the people deserve it, but because it's consistent with God's own character. And God agrees, and he recommits himself to a people that don't want to be committed to him. In the Bible, God is loyal and loving for no other reason than it's just who God is. Of course he wants his people to respond with chesed in return, but even when they don't, God's chesed remains. The prophet Hosea compared Israel's chesed to a morning mist that's here one moment and gone the next. But God's chesed is enduring. Like in the celebration of Psalm 136 that opens by saying, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, and then 26 times repeats, his chesed is forever. And so, after centuries of Israel betraying their commitment to God, and after humanity's long history of violence and death, God still kept his promise in a dramatic and drastic way by becoming human and binding himself to us in the person of Jesus. And the people who followed Jesus of Nazareth said that in him they encountered the God of Israel who is full of loyal love and faithfulness. Jesus is the ultimate loyal and loving human. And in his life, death, and resurrection, God opened up a new future for all of us and for all of creation. And God did this because it's just who God is, generous, loving, and eternally loyal to his promises. And when we experience the purity and power of God's loyal love shown through Jesus, it compels us to reimagine why and how we can show chesed back to God and to the people around us. This is what it means to say that God is overflowing with loyal That was awesome, right? Come on now, let's give God some praise that God is our Hesed. He shows his Hesed forever to us, right? That's a beautiful thing. So I want us to now jump into chapter three, and, and I want us to highlight some things because what I'm going to make a point to show you is how love, how loyalty uh, in demonstrating itself through love is uh, a blessing to our own lives in the way that it guides us through life. So in in Ruth chapter 3, verse 1, it says, One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now, Boaz, with whose women, uh, whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight, he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Now, some context of what that actually means, the whole winnowing, there's actually this barley feast because of the fact that uh, what has happened in Israel, there's been a famine, and yet God is showing his blessing on his people. He's kind of showing like, hey, I'm coming back. I, I still have a plan for you. So what he does is he, he kind of lets his grain to grow back again, and uh, Boaz, being smart as an entrepreneur, he takes advantage of this moment, and he's been working the land. He's been getting everybody to work for it. So this threshing floor is a, is a way that the Israelites uh, ended up taking the grain and, and removing the chaff from the grain. So they would throw the, ch throw the grain in the air. The chaff would blow the wind off, and then the grain would fall on the floor. And this is a way to uh, get all the grain that they needed. And that's what's happening here. There's this final uh, harvest that's come in, and they're basically going to take all the grain and then shell it out um, to everybody who's worked. So everybody's going to get their money and, and go home for the season. And this is kind of the end of that work period. The reason why Naomi is urging Ruth at this moment is because once that the season, this thing happens, it's pretty much over. Like Ruth is not going to see Boaz again, unlikely. And so they've had this season of encountering each other, but it seems like Boaz hasn't made a move yet, right? And Boaz seems a little interested, but at the same time, Ruth hasn't made a move either, right? Uh, they've encountered each other. They've heard of each other. They've talked. Uh, Boaz has looked out for Ruth in many ways, uh, providing for her, but there hasn't been any move. And so Naomi, I think she knows what's going on here between the two. She steps in and goes, hey, hey, uh, uh, you're, you're going to need to do something right now because the end of this whole season, this opportunity is coming to an end. And so he, she, she basically says in, in the next verse, wash, put on some perfume, get dressed in your best clothes, and then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you're there until he has finished eating and drinking. And when he lies down, Note the place where he is lying, and then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Now, this sounds a little, this sounds a little suspicious right here. Like, what, 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 who, who gives advice to this to a young lady 
to pursue a man, right? Here's, here's part of the, the context I want you guys to see uh, in reading this, okay? First off, it's not like in today's culture where you meet someone and then you date for a while, right? And then, uh, you know, we have more of an individualistic concept of meeting people and dating and kind of choosing. In, in these times, women didn't really have that kind of opportunities to do that. Right? In these times, most people had more of arranged marriages to get married to people, and that's very much a foreign concept for us. Right? We've kind of uh, you know, evolved a little bit to a status where uh, you know, women don't have to do things like that. They're not having to have their father tell them who they're going to marry and things like that. Right? We, we've given freedom for women to be able to choose who they're going to love. And, and in Israel, they do have, there's this, in the Bible, you'll see that there is this mutual choosing as well. It's not just all you know, where the father tells you what to do. But in this situation, there's a little bit of an awkwardness because, again, I told you, Ruth is a Moabite. The idea of an Israelite marrying a Moabite is not a mutual concept that, that an Israelite would go out of his way to do that necessarily, right? And so in this situation, Naomi kind of sees that, and what Naomi is proposing for Ruth is for her to make the proposal, which is, which is unique in some ways, right? That's not the normal way that someone would get married in those times. And yet, God is permitting it. God is allowing it according to his word. And so what we see is, a, is an opportunity for Naomi sees for Ruth to get dressed up and basically go down in like a wedding gown. Like, hey, I am ready. It is obvious. I am telling you I am ready for this thing, right? I'm, I'm ready to get married right now, right? And that's what, that's what Naomi is telling her to do. Now, the reason why Ruth is able to do this is because Boaz has recognized that Ruth displayed loyalty to his uh, to his. Uh, family member, Naomi, in the fact that he heard, he heard how she had helped Naomi in her time of need. If you read Ruth chapter 2, verse 11, Boaz replied, I have been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father, your mother, your homeland, and came to live with a people who you did not know before. And so what we see in Ruth is that Ruth from chapter one, being committed to following Naomi, and then going into chapter two, she goes out to uh, bring food and provide for Naomi. She's taking care of Naomi. And so this catches Boaz's attention, right? Boaz sees a woman who has value and virtue, and she, is, she knows who she is, and she's not even worried about being a Moabite in Israel, She's actually taking advantage of God's word. God's word allowed for strangers of the land and for widows and uh, for anyone who is a foreigner to be able to come to the corners of the harvest and take what they wanted. So Ruth is taking advantage of this, and this is what catches Boaz's eye because now he sees this woman, and what, he's, what he loves about her is she's obviously you'll see that Ruth is identified as being beautiful, but what catches more of his attention is his, her loyalty to her mother-in-law. Loyalty is also, as we saw in the video, a characteristic about how God is towards us. God wants to constantly display his love and his loyalty to you and I. In fact, the cross, Jesus Christ dying on the cross, is all about loyalty. It's all about Jesus being committed for us, knowing that our sins need forgiveness, our sins need to be pardoned, our sins need to be erased, and Jesus offers himself committed and loyal to his people to come and die on the cross for us. So this hesed, this act of kindness is all pointing to Jesus because what you're going to find out is that what God is doing through Ruth is he's bringing this act of kindness, this loyalty into the way that he's going to bring about his son Jesus later on. And more importantly, in this context, David, who will be the king of Israel in a time where there is no king. And so while loyalty is a characteristic of God that God displays time and time again, this is where it's really important for you and me. I hope you hone in on this with me. Loyalty is a commodity to God. And what I mean is that God looks at your life, and when he sees you display loyalty, whether it's a marriage, whether it's a friendship, whether it's at your workplace, whether it's uh, with some stranger that you meet in a time of a, a rough situation or suffering, 
which is the only time that real loyalty can ever be revealed, right? You, 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 can't be, you can't say that you're loyal in the times when necessarily it's good because it's easy to be loyal when everything works out, right? You all know that. You, you're cool with your friends and you're like, yeah, man, I'm loyal. I'm loyal to the end. It's not until like something happens to your friend that you actually find out whether you were loyal or not. Like when your friend got in a car wreck and then you showed up to care and take care of them and, and call them and you were like, what's happening, dude? That, that's when loyalty stands out, right? Or like in your marriage, in the context of your marriage. It's easy to say, you know, in the beginning stages of your marriage, like, yeah, I'm loyal. But it, no, not until you hit the, the rocks, the bet, when you're at the bottom of the barrel in your marriage or you're suffering or you guys are in a, in a, in a constant uh, fighting or situation or a quarrel. And then you realize that's when we're going to find out if you're really loyal or not in the end. Are you, is loyalty really in you that you're committed to the relationship? I feel like this is so important, especially in a time when suffering and pain in our country, in our, in our neighborhoods, and in people's marriages are going through so much. And, and what I would say is the, the testing of what God is doing through these times and these circumstances and situations where it's, it's like, why am I going through all this stuff, even at your workplace, is so that God can reveal your loyalty, because what I'm going to show you is when you, when you choose to be loyal in the time of suffering, God, and this is the first point for today, God is going to use loyalty to steer you into God's purpose. Because in this situation, Ruth is, Ruth is also a widow. She, she could have chose to stay in Moab and go back to her family, but she chose to suffer with Naomi. She chose to be and take care of her and show an act of kindness in this moment. And here's the crazy thing. This is the way that God is steering her into the blessing that you're going to see comes for her. This is how she's moving her to her man, so to say. This is how God is leading her to the person that she wants to be with. This is how God is using her to get to the next step and place in life is her loyalty. God sees Ruth's loyalty. And here's the crazy thing. While Ruth is being loyal to Naomi, other people are watching. Other people are watching what you're doing in your life. Other people are taking notes, especially the people that you impact the most. Because, because Ruth chose to be faithful to Naomi, she didn't know that, that Boaz heard about her, but Boaz did. Word, word through somebody, maybe it was gossip, I don't know. You know, maybe, maybe they were talking about how she's a Moabite and why, why is Naomi hanging out with the Moabite, right? It could have been a negative thing, but Boaz, being a man of God, being a noble man, he heard that and was like, wait, 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 the Moabite stayed faithful to Naomi? Oh, that, like he recognized loyalty in her. And so this gets back to her, and that's what catches his eye. He's this rich entrepreneur, and now he's looking at Ruth like, oh, you are the prospect of my life. You are the woman that I would like to be with. It, it catches someone's attention. And so loyalty will steer you into God's purpose. Verse 7, then Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, and he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. And the reason why he did that is is, is for a purpose. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you, he asked, right? Because it was dark, right? I am your servant, Ruth. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are the guardian redeemer of our family. Now, real quickly, she, she, some, some people have tried to, uh, in this verse, tried to make it sound like this is a sexual gesture on Ruth's part here. And this is not. This is Ruth really just coming to, her, coming to him and being honest and saying, listen, the, the garment that I want you to put on me is actually something that Jewish people in those days did to say that they were going to marry this woman. They would take, uh, in, in today's culture, I, I believe they take more like a, like a blanket or something like that that the, the husband owns, and he would put it over the, the, the bride and say, this is my wife. In these days, what it would be is that men used to wear like one scown, you know, like a one gown skirt. And so what a, a man would do is he would take his skirt and he would put it over the woman and say, you are mine in a marriage ceremony, right? In other words, they're, they're clothed together in the same covenant relationship. And so he's basically saying, you belong to me. So what Ruth is saying right here is, hey, I, I wanna get married. I, I, I'm coming to you. I think, you're, I think you're handsome. You're rich. You're a man of God. You got it all. I, I wanna be underneath your skirt, you know, right? <laughs> I wanna be with you. 
right? Now, this is, this is a little forward, right? This is, it's like, what, wait, what's going on here, right? But she's not asking to sleep with him. She's asking to marry him, right? This is, this is I mean, and again, that, that seems like a little awkward in some ways, but, but you know, if, if someone had to ask the question, you know, I've, 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 oh, no, men have to ask, uh, you know, the woman to marry them. I go, have you ever read the book of Ruth before? Because in this context, that's not the case. In some cases, God allows for a situation like this. He let Ruth say, hey, Boaz. And, and basically, Boaz, she's putting the idea in his head. And this is what Boaz says. Boaz says, the Lord bless you, my daughter. Amen. This kindness is great, that, that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger man, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of the town know that you are a woman, you are a woman of noble character. Although, uh, although it is true that I am the guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for tonight. And in the morning, he wants to do this duty as the guardian redeemer. Good. Let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. And so what he actually ends up doing is he basically says, yes, let's do this right now, okay? Uh, but in those times, as a guardian redeemer, a guardian redeemer was someone appointed to take care of someone in the family in case they were abandoned or if they became a widow or something tragic. God's word made an availability for that person's land and uh, for, the, for the marriage, for the woman to be able to be married to the guardian redeemer. And that, and that is Boaz right here. But there's actually someone more related, which tells me a lot about Boaz's character because he's not a man of God to just ignore God's word. He's a man who cares about the way things are done. Ladies, if you want a tip and if you, if you really want to know, if you're single and you're looking for a man, please recognize the virtues and the characteristics of Boaz. Boaz has got a job. All right, he's a man of God, and he's willing to always do what's right in God's sight, right? And, that, and so you, you see him, he's, he's, he sees Ruth, and like, technically, I mean, he could just jump the gun and be like, you know what, I am the guardian redeemer, because what happens is she's there at, the, at this barley uh, feast, and at the end of it, you know, what could happen is she could have gone off in the middle of the night and possibly been attacked or something like that, but he, he says, he's like, no, 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 don't go anywhere, it's late at night, girl, uh, you know, this is a heck of a time to do this, to propose to me, but uh, for your protection, stay here at my feet. I'm going to protect you. And then when this, just early enough that you can leave and nobody will see you because I don't want, and this is the great thing about Boaz in this next chapter. In verse 14, he says, so she lay at his feet until morning, verse 14, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. And when he did this, he poured into six measures of barley and placed the bundle on her. And then he went back to town. And the reason why uh, Boaz does this is because he's protecting Ruth's virtue. He knows that this Moabite woman looks like she came to the threshing floor with all these guys that were there and they're sleeping in the middle of the night. And they were there with, with him. They would know that something was going on. So he cares about the integrity of himself and, more importantly, the integrity of his future bride. He makes sure that, knowing that they didn't do anything wrong, he still says, like, hey, I don't, I don't want you to leave because I care about your own virtue as, as you have displayed loyalty. I'm going to be loyal to you and make sure that we do this properly. And so even he cares about the details of the way that she leaves properly, and he provides six uh, six uh, cups of barley, it's not for her, it's actually for Naomi and her to be able to have food while he takes care of the situation that he has to go in the town for. So this is what the last point is for today. Loyalty will secure you into God's protection. Loyalty will supply you with God's provision. God will provide for you when you've come and asked him you're ready to go. Your, your allegiance is unswavering to do and be committed to what he's called you to do because you're loyal. God will make sure that your supplies, what you need, is taken care of while he handles the matter. And this is what happens. Boaz, uh, then she told everything about Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley saying, 
Don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. And verse 18, then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. For the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. I love that verse. I love that what Naomi knows is that Boaz, as the, as the kinsman redeemer, and in Hebrew, it's the word goel, as the goel of the family, he goes out and he is determined to settle the matter today. He is going to take care of the matter. He is going to go out and do what he needs to do that he has in the title and the purpose as guardian redeemer of their family to make sure that Ruth and Naomi are taken care of for. And more importantly, that he gets to marry the beautiful woman that God has brought to him in this wonderful relationship. But listen, all of this happened because of loyalty. All this happened because Ruth chose to be loyal in the times that mattered, in the times of suffering. And so God, in the same way, that's the way he's going to work in your life. It's in the times of loyalty in your marriage. It's in the times of loyalty in your friendship right now or at your workplace that God is going to bring you into the next purpose of protection, provision, and the purpose in which God had you there in the first place. Sometimes people ask this all the time to me about, you know, when they're asking about what, they're, what God's doing in their life, and I'll often try to look for what are you committed to? Because if you're not committed to anything, God, God, God's not just gonna work through nothing. He's gotta look for your commitment. What are you, what are you committed to? What, are your, what, are you, what do you have an allegiance to? It, you can't set an allegiance to something if you're always looking out for yourself, like the people of Israel who are saying there was no king and they were doing right that was in their own eyes. They were looking out for themselves. They were always looking at what they wanted to do. But my thing to you is, what has God called you to be loyal to in this time? Maybe you can think about a person who's suffering right now in your, in your life. I know I had a friend recently whose father just passed away, and, and it was funny because just days before that happened, God had put in my heart to, to reach out to him and just kind of say, hey, uh, I want you to kind of reconnect with this person, and I did, and it turned out that his dad was just days away from dying, and, and soon enough, you know, the day came where he did actually pass away, and he called me, he told me, and we had a long conversation. I was there to pray with him about it, and, and I've been following up with him because I know this is a season that's rough for him. It's, it's hard to lose your dad, and he doesn't have his mom, and, and so it's just, it's just hard, but I was just thinking about how, you know, in that moment, the the question becomes is, were you loyal in your friendships when it really mattered? Or did, were you not there for someone? And so, and so with, and even with that, I want you to think about how Jesus, Jesus comes and constantly, even in the moments when you've been disloyal in your life, Jesus has constantly pursued you. Jesus has constantly come back for you and to save you in your moments of even being disloyal. Because what, one thing about God that we see is that in his character, he's always loyal. God is always going to be faithful to his word. He cannot not be loyal to you. You have to trust that. You have, to, you have to live and rest in that idea. And I promise you what I think happens for Ruth is as Ruth, even in her own suffering, offers herself to this loyal God, loyalty, her act of kindness comes out and God honors her act of kindness as a way of leading her to her Boaz. And I don't know about you, but I want to see for every single one of you come into your Boaz moment. I don't know what that is. Obviously, for some of you who actually want to get married to an actual Boaz, awesome. But your Boaz can be getting into you, into, the, into that place in your, in your workplace to get that advancement, that promotion, or maybe that calling that God is getting you to, or the new relationship, or for your marriage to be renewed, or, or for a friendship to re, re, be repatched. All of that's going to come out of your acts of loyalty to people. Amen? Amen. I want us to stand together as we uh, go into our time of, of worship. I, I want to, uh, firstly, firstly, I want to call us to, as we're worshiping God, as, we're, as we're, 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 we're praising God for his loyalty to us, I want, my desire is that you recommit your life to God, that you say today, as a people, as a church, as the people of have gathered this morning to hear this word, that we are dedicated to being loyal people. I mean, even some of us here need to come back to being loyal to church. 
Like God, God calls you to be loyal and faithful to the house, the people of God that he's called you to serve in, to love, to pour your life into. There's loyalty when it comes to that. There's loyalty for some of you to say even today, you, you've been not so loyal to your spouse or in a, in a, maybe it's a family member that you really don't like. And I, I can testify to that. <laughs> they're, they're, I mean, I'm not gonna put my, my business out there, but I'm just saying, you know, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's hard to be loyal to people that you don't like. It is, it's really tough. But God still says, be loyal, be faithful, show acts of kindness to them. Show them your love and your loyalty. And the reason why, and I'm telling you, the, this has convinced me so much because every part of my life where God has advanced me or God has blessed me, I realize in reflection, God was like, oh, uh, I saw your loyalty. I saw your commitment to this. I, I, it didn't go ignored by me. I saw it. And, I, and, and also, when you're at showing kindness and you're showing real loyalty to people, not for your own self gain, but just because you love someone, man, people will praise you for that. You will see other people say, hey, I saw what you did there out of nowhere, right? That thing that you were, or, or people recognize when you're displaying care for another person. God has people watching you all the time in our lives. And those people can be the people that God sets us up for to be our blessing, for, for his protection, his provision in our time of need, in our season that we're, we're ready to go. So my prayer for you as we worship Jesus, that you, we first, we just thank God for his loyalty to us, that he is a God who is faithful to us in every season of our lives. His, his desire to protect you and provide for you and for you to know his purpose for you is very real. But it cannot come without that love being known and then more importantly, that love being displayed through your own life so that God might bless you because you call him blessed. Amen? Amen. So let's praise God and then I'll come out and I'll bless us in our benediction and then we will go back into the world and show our acts of hased. You give life.